Dr. LaFallow, thank you so much for taking time to be interviewed yes. this morning. Um, you mentioned in previous interviews that your parents were really extraordinary. Can you tell us a little bit about them and why they were so important to you and, your, and what you've done over your career? Very well. Well, both of my parents were educators. My father was principal of a high school in Florida. My mother was principal of an elementary school. And they emphasized education to my sister and me. And my father had a statement that he would make, not only to his students at the high school at which he taught, but also to both of us. He said this, with a good education and hard work combined with honesty and integrity, there are no boundaries. I never forgot that. Growing up as a young black kid in a segregated, rigidly segregated South, and my father tells me that, I said, this is my father. If he tells me that, it must be true. He said, with a good education and hard work combined with honesty and integrity, there are no boundaries. And that meant a lot to me. That's I never forgot it. How did they, how did they handle the segregation laws with you? Um, did they try to protect you in some way from that? Or I guess it was almost impossible to well, do that. It was impossible to protect, but they also said this. They thought that one day it would change, but it hasn't changed now. And what you do, if you do it properly, if you do what you're supposed to do, you shouldn't get any trouble. Do what you're supposed to do. They kept coming back, my father, not only about the education, but he emphasized honesty and integrity. He said, you have to mean something. Your life has to mean something. Don't go around cheating people, you're honest. But you must have integrity. There has to be something within that lets you know this is the correct thing to do, this is the right thing to do, and not just so it doesn't make any difference. It does make a difference. Mm -hmm. So they never ran into any problems then, or they were able to avoid them? Oh, well, yeah, segregation was there, so yeah. when you say, call that problem, yes, you couldn't go here, you couldn't go, there's always something that was going on, but uh, that was the way it was, and since that was the way it was, you accepted that as the way it was, hoping and believing that one day it would change. How did you feel, finally, when the civil rights bills were passed? It's difficult to describe you how I felt because there were so many examples that I'd had and my colleagues had had, our friends, in terms of segregation, and you find it wasn't there. It was, it was just a fantastic feeling. It was a fantastic feeling. And so many things happened. And I'm going to jump forward a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. I went to the Army when I was a physician. I went to Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. You had to get training before you went abroad. I had this excellent training. And it's the night before we were finishing, and three white colleagues and I went to a, a theater. It was a wonderful movie. I forgot what it was we wanted to see. We got the ticket counter. The ticket uh, agent was there, and she looked at my colleague and said, you can come in. She said, but you can't. Of all the things that I've experienced, I think that perhaps hurt worse than anything else. Here, I'm getting ready to go to help the men and women who are defending our country. Right. And I can't go to a movie. It was in Texas. I can't go to a movie. And all my colleagues said, oh, no, you've got to let him in. They said, she said, no. Then I said, well, why don't you go? They said, oh, no, we wouldn't do it. Of course they wouldn't go. But that was a painful ride back to base. You sit oh, in the car. Was... What do you say? Yeah. You try to say something. It didn't make any difference. Nobody remembers anything that was said. Right. But that, that's one episode, and I can think of others, but that was one that stands out in my mind right. because here I am, a well-trained surgeon, cancer tra trained, I trained in cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, one of the best mm -hmm. places in the world. I'm going to Germany to have my obligated military service, and this happens to me. Well, That's that can incredible. Happen. Yeah. That's just one And that example. was in the late 50s. That was, it yes. was the end of 1959 because I finished my cancer training in 1959 uh -huh. and went to uh, uh, join the Army. It was early 1960, just prior to my going to Munich, Germany. Just prior to that. Yeah, yeah. So? It's hard yeah. for me to understand how white people could grow up in the South under that system. I mean, it's hard. I, well, that's, I can understand how it would happen. That's how you grew up. That's what your mother, mother yeah, and father taught you. And so that was the normal. That, yeah. That's the way it was. That's the way but it was. 
it's interesting that the South has developed so much since then oh, because oh people goodness. feel has it? Oh my are goodness. happy yes. to move oh, down there now yes, indeed. because the weather is good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. It has changed so much. You're right. Right. You're yeah. correct. Yes. Are we rolling oh, yet? Oh, yes, we are. Oh, oh okay. Um, I read that you established an endowment at Florida A&M University. Can you tell us about your experience there? Um, how did it set you on the track for medical school? Very well. My father taught at Florida and M. Florida Agricultural and Mechanical College in the late 1929-1930. He taught there and spent one year. I was born in Tallahassee, Florida, and my father taught there. My mother went to college there. He married her when she was just a, a young girl. And she went to college, at, went to summer school, eventually graduated. I went to undergraduate school there. My sister went to undergraduate school there. With the background that I got there, I was able to get in medical school. So I felt a strong attachment to Florida a &M. And after my mother died, I wanted to do something. My sister and I wanted to do something. So we established a scholarship, not only in her name and my father's name, both, because of their attachment to Florida a &M and what it meant to both of us. So that's why we established the endowment. I had some wonderful teachers there. The professor of biology, and you wanted to do well there because you thought if I did well in biology, I'd get in medical school. If I did well in biology, I'd get in medical school. But the, maybe one of the best teachers I had was my professor of English. I majored in biology, I minored in English. And I'll never forget the first week in our English course, Somebody said something and he used a preposition. He said, this is going to just be between you and I. And the professor stopped. He said, that is the most common mistake made by the college graduate in grammar. Not using the proper case. He said, using the personal pronoun, you must use it in the objective or accusative case, following a preposition or following a transitive verb. And you, therefore, you can't say that. I never forgot that. That was my first week, I'm 15 years old, my first week in my English course, and the professor says this. That's just one example, but he's one professor I had. I had one professor who happened to be a man who had his MD and PhD, and he had gone to Howard's Medical School. So I really loved having him teach me. I said, perhaps this is going to give me a greater chance of getting into medical school. So I had a wonderful experience in college. Finished college in three years. I went at 15, I graduated when I was 18, and I was in to medical school when I was 18, so I was, I was very fortunate there. But I had some wonderful teachers. And how did, how did you decide to go to medical school, or what attracted you to medicine? I can, two things. When I was growing up, uh, I had a godmother, and my godmother's husband was the lone black physician in the little town in which I grew up, Quincy, Florida. Dr. W.S. Stevens, he had gone to Meharry. And he used to tell me what a wonderful profession medicine was, how you could help people and you feel good about yourself. But in addition to that, when I was eight or nine years old, I was coming home from school one day. There was a little bird in the street. I was a robin or a sparrow. I couldn't tell which one. But the bird couldn't fly. The wing was broken. Something had happened. So I took the little bird home. My father said, we've got to do something. So he got some tongue depressors. We splinted the wing. And three or four days later, after he'd, we'd given him some water and some crackers and so forth, he flew away. Really? I said, this is my first patient. And look, he has done well. It has done well. I am going to be a physician. And both of those things played a big role in my becoming a physician, wanting to become a physician. What Dr. Stevens, my godmother's husband, had said, and this experience with this little bird that could not fly. That's wonderful. Yeah. Both that's true cool. stories. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you went to Howard Medical School, and that was your first experience out of the deep south or the lower south? Not uh, really, because my mother's people moved to Chicago. Oh, okay. The, the promised land. So, so I'd gone to Chicago, but they lived on the south side, which is all black, and my experience was practically all black. And uh, so essentially, even though I'm in Chicago, it, my experience really didn't change at all. Yeah, while I'm still saying. in the south. Yeah, still in the south. It did not right. change. Yeah. Um, how, was, how was Washington at the time? 
Washington was still segregated. When it I was. Went. Oh, yes, indeed, it was. Yeah. For example, I can tell you something. I'm jumping forward a little bit. After I'd completed my surgical training, my cancer training, I was on the faculty, my first year back, we had one of my teachers, a cancer surgeon, come from New York, and we wanted to take him to dinner. Good. And what did we do? Where did we take him? We took him to National Airport for dinner. Why? That was one place in Washington that was not segregated. And we didn't want him come from New York to feel that he was in a place that he had to be careful because of us. Oh, we oh like it was just a routine thing. Right. So that was Washington, D.C. But it was Washington, D.C. And I'd gone to Howard University, and Howard had a, a wonderful reputation. And I said, I'm going to make the most of this because I want to become a physician. Mm -hmm. And to become a physician, I must do well in medical school. And I wanted to do well. So what was your experience like at Howard? You, you were... Um... Oh, it, it was a wonderful experience. I had some wonderful teachers. Um, I think about, I had three teachers in surgery and one in anatomy that really influenced my life. All my teachers, I thought, were, were very good teachers. When I went to Howard in September 1948, by far the best known person was Dr. Charles Richard Drew, the man who had done work on blood preservation. I was a member of the last class he taught, March 31st, 1950, he taught my class. The next day, he was on a trip to Tuskegee, Alabama, and he was killed in what he termed, uh, was termed a tragic automobile accident. Oh. I was in his class on March 31st, 1950, a Friday. The next day, a Saturday, my class had a pharmacology class. And I always sat on the front row because I didn't want to miss anything. So I'm on the front row. The pharmacology technician comes in and speaks to the pharmacology professor, I couldn't hear what he said, but the professor's face turned ashen. He then turned to the pharmacology technician and said this, you shouldn't joke like that on April Fool's Day. And what did the pharmacology technician then say? He said, oh, I wouldn't joke like that. The, prof the professor then turned to my class and said, class, I have some very sad news for you. Our head of the Department of Surgery Dr. Charles Richard Drew was killed in a tragic automobile accident today. Class is dismissed. Oh, it's hard for me to describe to you how we as students felt. This man cast such a huge shadow. We were wondering if the school could continue to exist. Well, and yet we know. World, he, oh, he, oh, had he, oh, oh, he had a worldwide reputation. Oh, he had a worldwide reputation. Oh, absolutely. He was only 45 years old when he died. He had a favorite statement he made to students. And it's another one I always remember. He said, excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. I never forgot that. If you did it well enough, people had got to notice it. I don't care your race, your ethnicity, your religion, your political affiliate, whatever. They had to notice. Excellence of performance. <clears throat> excellence of performance. What, what exactly, I know that he did something about... Blood. blood transfusions, but what exactly was oh, what his did, major oh, what he did, he did some of the, Dr. Charles Richard Drew did some of the seminal work on preservation of blood. He went to Columbia Presbyterian, worked with a man by the name of Dr. John Scudder. He did some of the seminal work, and his thesis is entitled Banked Blood. And Dr. Scudder said, this thesis is a masterpiece, both in form and content. Dr. Drew was one of my best students. So he did some of the seminal work on how we preserve blood. Oh, that's fascinating. Oh, it is. Yeah. He spent two years there. And another reason I think he said excellence of, excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers, he was accepted for one year, but he wanted to spend two. The chief of surgery wrote a letter to the dean said, we can only offer him one year. And we'll let you know if we get another position available. After Dr. Drew had been there about nine months, the chief of the Department of Surgery wrote our dean, the dean at Howard's Medical School, and said, we are offering Dr. Drew a second year. His performance had been so outstanding after nine That's months, yeah. they had to offer him a second year. Excellence of performance. Doing it so well, people have got to notice it. They've got to. That's, that's have no funny. choice. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Burke, 
and I'm not sure how to Burke Syfax. Dr. Burke Mickey okay. Syfax. He took over he, after Dr. Drew died. Oh, he did. He did. He took over after Dr. Yeah. Drew died. And yeah. we called him Master of the Abdomen. Why? Because he had excellent diagnostic skills. He was a smooth operator. He had what we call beautiful hands. His hands moved so well within the abdominal cavity. You said, if I can just have my hands move like that as a surgeon, I would be in great shape. Dr. Burke Mickey Syfax. And much of the surgery that I learned as a general surgeon came from him. Because really? I only knew Dr. Drew as a teacher, not as a surgical resident. See, Dr. Drew died when I was a sophomore medical student, April 1st, 1950. I went to Howard's Medical School September 1948. But you learned from Dr. Syfax. Uh, Dr. Um, Syfax, I learned most residency. of my surgery from him and from Dr. Jack White. <clears throat> now, who was Dr. Jack White? He was the first black, first African American to go to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center for training in cancer. But why? Who arranged him to go there? Dr. Charles Richard Drew. Because Dr. Drew knew the chief of surgery at Columbia Presbyterian, who then had gone to Memorial Hospital. And since Dr. Drew knew him, he said, I'm trying to set up a cancer center here. Will you accept this young man? And he said yes. So that's how Dr. White got to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. That's why I became a person who trained there. Why? Because Dr. White recommended me, because Dr. White had done such a great job, they accepted me. But who arranged for Dr. White to go there? Dr. Drew. So if Dr. Drew had not arranged for Dr. White to go there, there's a very good possibility I would not have gotten at Memorial Hospital. When I went there, it was called Memorial Hospital for the Treatment of Cancer and Allied Diseases. Now it's called Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center because the Sloan Kettering part is the research part of the hospital. I see. How long did you train there? Two and a half years. Oh, wow. I went there July 1957 and left December 1959. Two and a half years I was at Memorial Hospital and then I went to there and went to Munich, Germany for two years. I see. So um, you did that, you did your residency at I did my residency Howard. at Howard. I did my and internship at Homer Phillips in St. Louis from 1952-53. 1953 to 1957, I did my general surgical residency at Howard University. 1957-1959, mm -hmm. I did my cancer training at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I called Memorial Hospital for the treatment of Cal treatment of cancer and allied diseases at that time. 1960 to 61, I spent two years obligatory service, obligatory military service in Munich, Germany. Nice. I did not want to go to Munich. Why? When I was growing up as a young boy, I can remember this so well, I was seven or eight years old. My father came home one day and with our local newspaper, I think it was the Daily Democrat of the Florida Times Union, and on the front page was a picture of Neville Chamberlain, mm -hmm. Chancellor of Great Britain, holding up a sheaf of papers in his hand, and the caption was, this Munich agreement represents peace for our time. And my father looked at it and he said, I don't know about that, Hitler is a, is a bad man. It was 1937, 38. We didn't know a lot of the things that were going on, but we knew some of them. He said, Hitler is a bad man, and that's why I didn't want to go to Munich. Now the war was over and all that, we know all the things that Hitler had done. I did not want to go to Munich, Germany, that's horrible. Two of the happiest years of my life. Really? Two of the happiest years of my life. Why? First, excellent training. Now, the war is over. First, excellent training. And my wife and I had the opportunity to travel all around Europe. We didn't have that before. I was making more money than I'd ever made. <laughs> I think at $50 a month as an intern, $100 a month as a resident. My first check there, I think, with my monthly pay and my uniform allowance, it was close to $1,000. I'd never seen that kind of money. <laughs> but that was just the first check. But the whole idea was a wonderful experience. I was chief of general surgery. I was the only one on the staff who had had special cancer training. So it was just a wonderful experience. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, when did you become interested in joining the, joining the American College of Surgeons? And um, how was that process for you? I can tell you. you. If when I was an intern at Homer Phillips, they had a strong surgical program. Why? Because it was associated with Washington University, the big white university in St. Louis. 
and the professors that would come over to Homer Phillips and teach surgery and talk about the American College of Surgeons. You must think about becoming a member of the American College of Surgeons. You must do that. But what do I remember? I can remember when I was a student and the word had come out that Dr. Drew wanted to become a member. He was denied membership. He was denied membership? He was denied membership. But after he was finally graduated, uh, Dr. Drew was denied membership in the American College of Surgeons. But in 1950, they had told him, the college, you can become a member when we had the meeting in the fall. He died in April, April 1st, 1950. But what did the college do that I found just wonderful? They granted him posthumous fellowship in 1951. Oh, that's good. Posthumous fellowship yeah, in the wonderful. American College of Surgeons in 1951. So I first heard about the college as a medical student, but it didn't mean as much to me because I'm a medical student then. But once I go to my internship and they have a strong surgical program, and certainly not only at Homer Phillips, but at Howard, Friedman's Hospital, I learned so much and heard so much about the college. You must become a member of the college. It stands for the highest standards. You must do that. So first heard about it as a medical student, but primarily because Dr. Drew had been denied membership, fellowship, later was granted posthumously. A lot about it as an intern and really a lot about it as a surgical resident. Yeah. And so you've got to do it. And then a lot more when I was a, a member of the military in Munich in 1960 and 61. Going back to your internship at Homer Phillips, yes. Homer G. Phillips, um, how was your experience there, um, both in the internship and also living in St. Louis? I had a wonderful experience. The internship was great. Why did I go to Homer Phillips in the first place? I knew that I wanted to come back to Howard to do my surgical residency, but I wanted to get another kind of experience. And my colleagues had learned that Homer Phillips had a wonderful internship, great surgical program, primarily because it was related to what? The relationship it had with Washington University in St. Louis with some of the biggest names in surgery. And so that's why I chose to go there. And the living, it was a segregated uh, town, but I didn't get away that much anyway. I'm doing my work as an intern. But in surgery, I learned so much from the men who came over, no women then, but came over from Washington University to Homer, to Homer Phillips to teach us. I learned a lot. I had a wonderful experience as an intern at Homer Phillips. A lot related to the men and women who were at Homer Phillips, but a lot related also to the men and women who came over, the men who came over from Washington University to teach us. I can remember people like Dr. Robert Elman, was there, Dr. Carl Moyer. I remember these names very well. Oh, really? And they taught us so much. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. What are, what are some other names that you remember from? Well, Dr. Evans Graham had been there, but he was not one of my teachers. He was a big name, and we heard about him all the time. Right. But the people who actually came over that I remember were Dr. Robert Elman and Dr. Carl Moyer. But Evans Graham, we heard so much about over and over. Well, yeah. he was a giant. You're supposed to hear about him. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, now, uh, jumping back forward to no, no, um, American College of Surgeons. Yes. Um, how did you feel on your acceptance and installation um, to it's the hard, college? It's hard to describe to you how I felt. I was so happy when I got the letter saying, you have been accepted for fellowship in the American College of Surgeons because it's something you'd heard so much about over the years. This is finally happening to me. Sometimes you wonder, is this really true? Is this really true? And I'll never forget, I can remember the date, the year, and all of where I went into the college. I was admitted to the American College of Surgeons as a fellow, October 8th, 1964, the convocation ceremony in Chicago. Never forgot that. I marched in side by side with a colleague named Edward E. Cornwell, Jr. Why do I mention that? Not only was he a close friend and a surgical colleague, his son, a young man whom I taught, who trained in surgery in California, became Professor Johns Hopkins, is now the LaSalle D. LaFall Jr. Professor and Chair of the Department of Surgery at Howard University. Oh my gosh. And so I marched in with his father yeah. to become a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. There's no yeast in that, sir. That's just the way it happened, that's and nice. not inflated in any way. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yes. Um, in 
1972, you presented um, a, a paper on the alarming increase of cancer mortality in the U.S. black population. Um, what was the genesis of your study, and can you tell a little I, bit I about can. it? I yeah. can. Dr. Jack White was head of our cancer center. <laughs> I'd done my cancer training then, and coming back, we noticed that was cancer health disparity noted primarily among African Americans, and we weren't looking that much at Hispanics or other groups, but that was a real difference. For example, the incidence of cancer of the breast then was high in white women than black women, but who had the higher mortality rate? Black women. The whole idea, we noticed example after example of that. So we said, we've got to call attention to that. And we did in that paper, and I was active also in the American Cancer Society, and we had a conference called The Challenge of Cancer in Black Americans. And since I got to be president of the American Cancer Society, along with some colleagues, I said, we've got to have a national conference on this. And we did. But it related to that study that we had done. So the conference was based on data showing that there was this alarming increase in cancer. And not only the incidence increasing, but the mortality was increasing. And it was more than it should have been if you compared it to the white population. Do you think that's because of race or because of socioeconomic status or both? No, no, I think it's primarily because of socioeconomic status and lack of access to care. Well, I think the data have shown that. Of course, we didn't know that then, but the data have shown that that's actually the case. There's no question about it. Yes. It's still the situation, is it but, not? But it's, much, but it's much less than it was. Still the situation, but much less. So that shows we're making progress. That shows we are making progress. Right, right. And what do you think has brought about the change? Uh, the fact that, first, that we're aware of it, that we've called attention to it. Mm -hmm. If you don't think a problem exists, you're not going to do anything about it. First, we've called attention to it. And not only have we looked at it in the American Cancer Society, we've looked at it in the American College of Surgeons, institutions have looked at it, and we want to do something about it. And something is being done about it, and has been done about it, and continues to have something done about it. And it's something we must continue to do, and that's so important. Thank you. <clears throat> um, you've been, of course, very active in the college since yes. you became a fellow. Yes. Um, besides <clears throat> being president, you were active um, on several committees and, and projects. Can you tell us a little bit about what you did prior to you becoming president? Yes. Well, I was very interested in the cancer problem, so I was very active with the Commission on Cancer. But I was fortunate, fortunate in another way. What happened in 1983? I became secretary. I was the first African American to become secretary of the American College of Surgeons, to hold any kind of office, official office in the American College of Surgeons. So not only was that a great opportunity for optics, for visuals, why? Because I carried the great mace at the annual meeting, so people would see me, they could see this face. So this is not the usual face that I see. And not only that, but you were involved in the administrative, uh, the administrative structure, the problems that came up, the different committees you had say in, uh, listen to, and you, were, you wanted to be absolutely certain that there were enough minorities, trained minorities, in the different committees. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was something that I wanted to do and be sure about that. People often ask me, well, how did you feel about being uh, the first uh, African-American secretary of the American College of Surgeons, the first president? My stock answer has always been, I never mind being the first. Somebody has to be first, but I don't want to be the only. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. You don't want to be the only. Right. You, you want to do everything you can to be sure others have the opportunity that you had. Yeah. Well, last year we interviewed the first woman president. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you did, um, yes. And <coughs> I'm sure, though I well, haven't seen too many members uh, yet, because we just arrived yesterday, yes. but um, <coughs> I'm sure the diversity factor is much oh, oh, higher now oh, than it, it was. Oh, it, and it um, should be. When, oh, oh, when yeah, it joined. is. Uh, much, and it should be. How, how do you think this is affecting the, um, how do you think it's affecting the college, and how do you think it's affecting medicine in general? Anytime you can show that all people are capable of holding positions, responsible positions in any organization, it helps. 
and it's helped the college. Having more women involved, more minorities involved, you must continue to do that. It, it's made the college stronger. We can do a better job with what we do. We must continue to do it. Can't ever forget it. But remember this, just because I had one woman, that doesn't mean you stop there. You don't mind being the first, but you don't want to be the only. And, and another thing, if you're the only, it looks as though you are being selfish. I want to say that I was the only one they've ever had. Oh, now what does that say? We're here today, you're gone tomorrow. We, we know we're not going to be here forever. But, and I say that over and over, and I'm sure that it's not original with me, but somebody told me this to little Sal. Remember this, you don't mind being the first, but you don't want to be the only. So in other words, you've got to do everything you can to help others come along, other black men, black women, African-American men, women, to do what you've done. You have to do that. That's interesting. Was, um, what did you want to accomplish as president, and do you feel that you did? Well, I think so. What did I want to accomplish? I wanted to be sure that on all the committees, on all the programs we had, that minorities, in my case, I was including women in that, that all minorities, racial ethnic minorities, sexual minorities, gender minorities, were included in all the programs and committees we had. That's one thing I wanted to do. And I worked very closely with Dr. C. Rollins Handler. He was the director then. And I think we, we were able to do that. And I think that was important. Of all the things you think about, sure, I talked about ethics, I talked about raising money, and I talked about the value of research. I was not one to do that. But the one thing I believe I was the first to do was to emphasize the great value of diversity in college activities the programs and the committees. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to achieve. And I believe to some degree I did. And sometimes you can exaggerate your sense of importance, you see. So there were so many people who helped, though. I, I often think about that. Somebody asked me, well, why do you think you became president? Well, you think you've done a decent job. And I know some people I know were in my corner. But there were a tremendous amount of people who told me, but so-and-so was in your corner. I didn't know that. So there are many more people who assist you and help you that you know about. You know the ones who do, but there are a lot who help you that you don't know. And something else you have to keep in mind. One strong no vote from a strong member of the committees, uh, of the colleges committees and the structure that, that's choosing the officers, a strong no vote means you don't become president, you don't become secretary. If somebody's a very powerful member of a committee, the nominating committee, or the committee's putting recommendations forward. If that person has a big name, he says, no, I just don't want him, no, I just don't, you don't get it. You, all the other people can say yes, but you don't. So you not only have to think about the people who helped you get it, but for others. But the point is you don't want to be a sycophant. In other words, you want to do it, I'm not going to, as be, and maybe this isn't good for the interview, but just suck up to someone and be, play, play a sycophantic role so I get something. You don't do that. Yeah. No, yeah. no absolutely not. No. Well, that's good. My father used to say this. He says, always be willing to compromise to reach your goals, but never compromise on principle. I never forgot that. If you have a basic principle, I'm less than a man or I'm less than a woman in doing this, you can't do it. Right. If it means I don't become president, I don't become president. So you're not doing it because you say, I want him to like me, I want her to like me. You do it because you think it's the proper thing to do. But you want to be sure that it is something proper and do it for that reason, not because you're trying to get ahead. Mm -hmm. If you do it well enough, what did Dr. Drew say? Excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. Just do it well. It's really interesting you keep coming back yeah, to because ex that, excellence that, and performance that, that and I see so, your parents that, mean, that means so, so very much. Yeah. I have to since it hadn't come to you, but one of my favorite expressions is if it, uh, one of my favorite expressions is this, if I may say it, equanimity under duress. Now, what does that mean? Maintaining that degree of calmness that will allow you to do what's appropriate in any circumstance. How did that come about? When I was a freshman in medical school, the dean of our College of Medicine said, I want all of you talking to my class to read this book one day. There's a book entitled Equanimitas, written by Sir William Osler, who had first been at Johns Hopkins and later became the Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford. And what was he emphasizing in that book? Maintaining a degree of calmness, because when you do that, it will allow you to do what's appropriate 
in any circumstance. Because again, if you respond in a fit of pique to something, you almost always do something or say something that you never would have done or said had you remained calm, had you remained tranquil. So equanimity under duress means so much. Because sometimes someone says something to you, you jaw back and you say, I guess I told him and the ex expertise that run through your mind. And you feel good for about how long? Maybe 10 minutes. After that, you say, how could I have done that? I'm a professional. How could I possibly have said what I said? So what do you do? You maintain equanimity under the earth, and you don't say it. You don't do it. But, so a couple of things. You, you can see how expressions have meant a lot to me. My father's what he says with a good education, Dr. Drew, excellence of performance, this equanimity under the earth, all mean something to me. And I impart those to the medical students and residents whom I teach. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, the American College of Surgeons was founded 100 years ago, 1913. 1913, yes. What do you think the major issues are facing the college today? Uh -oh. And right. do you think it's going to remain relevant over the next 100 years? There is no question that the American College of Surgeons will remain relevant over the next 100 years. It's a tremendous organization, but we face challenges. What must we do? We must continue to let young men and women know what a wonderful profession, what a wonderful profession surgery is, what we're doing to help the one person who we must always help, that's the patient. No matter what we do, the one person whom we must always show our allegiance is the patient, the man, woman, or child who comes to us for care. If that Patients know that, that we want to give them our very, very best. That's absolutely essential. That's something we must do. But in addition to doing that, I think we have to be sure that we are becoming more aware about the legislative aspects that are going on in medicine. So whatever we can do to maintain strong ties with our legislators, very important. Mm -hmm. I hear so many colleagues now speak about reimbursement problems. And I notice I don't put that first. I think letting people know we are concerned about them, I want to make you well. What is our charge as physicians? To help people retain and regain health, without which nothing in life means anything. If you don't have your health, I don't care what it is you want to do, you can't do it and enjoy it. So, and the college is so important that from the surgical aspect, helping you get well, this man, woman, or child who has some illness, to get well, and we want to do all we can there. So bringing forth the highest and highest quality of care that we can give. We want to continue to emphasize research. So care, number one, our obligation to the patient. Em continue to emphasize research. Doing what we can to be sure that the men and women who are providing this care get proper reimbursement. Th that we must do. And that shows you must have, continue to have a strong legislative presence. But I don't put that first. I think the first thing is for us to believe in our hearts and our souls and our minds that we must always give the patient our very, very best. And that's why the college is so important. Every year I come to the college meeting and I hear the residents give the fellowship pledge. Mm -hmm. it, really, it, it warms my heart because it's so meaningful. I, I, this year I read it and reread it. It's just still so relevant, so important to do what is said in that fellowship pledge giving our very, very best to the patient. That's what it comes down to, isn't it? Giving our very best to the patient all the time. And if you don't do that, everything else you do doesn't amount to anything. <clears throat> How do you think um, the practice of surgery will work under Obamacare or Affordable Care Act, although President Obama calls it Obamacare now. Yeah, right. So. Well, uh, I've tried to read that uh, bill very, very carefully, and I've heard a lot of talks. Overall, I'm in favor of it. Now, you say, well, why are you in favor of it? Because what I've been able to read is going to afford health care to some patients who've never had health care before, never had access to health care. That alone, to me, is worth it, having access to care. And I've heard all the arguments back and forth, it's going to cost more, here's going to... I believe patients will get better care, and patients who've never had care, access to care will get that. So I think the positives outweigh any negatives. And the one thing we must do as surgeons is continue to emphasize something I've talked about before, 
our obligation to the patient. And if we can have more men, women, and children now who have access to care than they had before, isn't that a positive? Isn't that a big plus? I think so. So I'm, I'm in favor of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, so-called Obamacare. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, Susan left the room. Or did she? Yeah. Frank, do you have any questions? Well, I was going to ask him about the Affordable Care Act, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you see where I stand. And no, believe me, I spent, a, I spent a lot of time <laughs> listening to people and reading about it and this and that. But I just think that fact alone, we'll have people who will have access who didn't have it before. If you had your, if you had your way, yes, and you were setting up your own health care syst yes. system, what would you do? Do you think? Uh, I, essentially, I would do what is being done on the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Okay. But and the main thing I think is access to care. Now, the care must be quality care. We know that. But if you don't have access to any care, how can you possibly get better? So access to care is so important. You talk about things you must continue to do. Research is so important. I think about what's going on in my field now in cancer. Oh, really? Oh, all the changes. When I came along, every woman who had cancer of the breast, I can remember doing this operation so many times, entire breast, muscles, all the lymph nodes. Women walked around with their arms swollen because we took out all the lymph nodes. This story, when I was in the Army, I just arrived and I operated on the major, a major who was head of the nurses at Munich Hospital. I did a classical radical mastectomy and took out the lymph nodes and I said, oh, major, actually you are doing very well. We got all the cancer out, all the margins were negative and you had no positive lymph nodes. She said, oh, I'm so happy. As the weeks and months went by, what did I notice? Her terms of endearment toward me became what? Fewer and fewer. Why? Because her arm was getting bigger and bigger. Oh. She came, she said, Captain LaFall, but look at my arm. I said, well, I, you remember I told you that when we take the lymph nodes out, you may get some swelling, but we'll get, put an, an elastic banjo and try to get the swelling down. She said, but why'd you take all those lymph nodes out? I said, well, we wouldn't know they were negative until we took them out, until we had taken them out. You mean you had no way of knowing before you took them out? And I said, that time, no. She said, well, I hope you find a way. But I could tell she was very upset with me. And I left the army, and her still having that feeling, and I can understand why. What do we do today? We do something called a sentinel node biopsy. We take out a couple of lymph nodes. If they're negative, you don't take out anymore. You don't take out anymore. I but see. I just think about that. And so, you see, just that is just one example. But we are just so much better now in what we were able to do. And we're able. My father, I'm changing the subject now, my father died of hypertension. He was 51 years old, died in my senior year in medical school. Uh -huh. And uh, all he, he was put on the rice diet, because that's all we had then. I think now of the medications we have to treat hypertension. There are so many, there are legions, there are so many. We didn't have that then. But in almost every area we've made progress but we still have to make progress. You see, we're making progress, but we're not there yet. And I'm often asked, do you think we'll ever get the universal health care? And I said, well, I, I, I hesitate to say we will, but I don't have to say we won't. But I make this statement, if we do enough research, it is conceivable, it is conceivable that one day, perhaps, we'll have a universal cure. Yeah. But we'll continue to make progress. And that's why our research is so important. Caring for the patient, care what we know today, research, being sure that you don't have to drive young men and women away. That's why I think we have to be sure that you get a fair uh, price, a fair uh, ways for what you do. You reimburse properly, not inappropriately, appropriate re reimbursement. But you, I never like to put that first because, we, oh, then you're just money hungry. No, 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 no. I think now when I talk to young men and women, they come to me, the main thing they're talking about is what can I do to help patients? They believe, as I always tell them, you'll make what my father used to tell me, a decent living. You'll be able to take care of your fam family. He didn't tell me you'll be able to get this and that. No, you'll make a decent living. And not only that, but you feel good about what you do. Mm -hmm. Last thing, and I'll uh, know you t our time is up. I was leaving the hospital one day, and I ran into a lady. She said, oh, Dr. LaFalle, so good. And she said, I'll never forget what you did for me. I said, oh, she said, I just thank you so much. 
know what she was talking about. I said, oh, Ms. X, uh, let, me run upstairs. Uh, let me run upstairs. I forgot something. I want to see what I had done for her. I hadn't forgotten anything. <laughs> I, I got her records. What I had done for her was so, to me, meaningless, so minimal. But to her, think what it meant. She said, I'll never forget what you did for me. <laughs> that, that gets you right here. <laughs> so a patient tells you, I'll never forget what you did for me. And I couldn't even remember what it was. So I tell young, my young students, if the patient thinks it's important, you've got to think it's important. Mm -hmm. And you've got to do your best to take care of that problem. That's so true. So true. Well, thank you so oh, much. Really.